โอเคเริ่มแล้วสวัสดีทุกคนนะครับที่รับชมเราอยู่ทางไลฟ์เวลานี้นะครับเวลานี้และวันนี้เรากำลังจะได้พูดคุยกับนักวิชาการาด้านประวัติศาสตร์นะครับและด้านกฎหมายที่มีความเชี่ยวชาญเกี่ยวกับเรื่องสิทธิมนุษยชนนะครับเรื่องปัญหาสิทธิมนุษยชนในปัจจุบันนะครับในภาพรวมของโลกเวลานี้นะครับเขาไม่ได้พูดถึงเรื่องสิทธิมนุษยชนในเชิงแบบเชิงชมแต่ว่าเชิงตั้งคําถามว่าสิทธิมนุษยชนเป็นสิ่งที่เพียงพอหรือเปล่านะครับตอนนี้ในกระบวนการการเคลื่อนไหวในประเทศไทยเองเราก็พูดถึงเรื่องสิทธิมนุษยชนกันมากนะครับแต่ว่าเราจําเป็นที่ต้องคิดไปไกลกว่านั้นหรือเปล่าดังนั้นวันนี้เรามีผู้เขียนหนังสือ The Last Utopia แล้วก็ Not Enough นะครับเป็นศาสตราจารย์แห่งมหาวิทยาลัยเยลชื่อว่าซามูเอลมอยนะครับจะมาพูดคุยกับเราเขาขึ้นเลยเพิ่ง Hello I'm Native President of Political Science Student Union จุฬาลงกรณ์ University Warm welcome you guys to our series Beyond Boundaries again Throughout this year we will invite speakers around the world academics Activists, politicians, to talk about violent issues that we are facing today. Today we have Professor Samuel Moy, Professor of Jurisprudence and Professor of History at Yale uh, University. He wrote book called "The Last Utopia: Human Rights in History and Not Enough Human Rights in an in Unequal World," which has been uh, very warm acclaim. By um, somebody like uh, Panchat Mishra, who is very uh, world-renowned intellectual, as he said that a sharpening interrogation of the liberal order and the institute of global governance created by arguably for Pax Americana consistency blessing. So it's very interesting that today we will have him with us. So, okay. Right. So he's uh, hello, Mr. Hi. Sam. Hi. Hi. How are Hi. you? Hi. Oh, great! Fantastic great. here. Great. Yeah. Okay. So, I think we need to like start now. Okay. Need to wait. Um, just to give us some like brief introduction about your argument. Can you discuss about human rights and its relationship to material e equality, which is the main focus of your book, um, Not Equal, right? For our audience to have a background knowledge on this issue. Okay, I think you have some presentation, right? Good. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll so I'll just speak I'll, for twenty five minutes or so and and yeah. give you an overview of of my book and. Uh, it's nice to be with you to begin with. I'll, I'll just um, show you some slides just to make it, um, you know, more interesting, um, and uh, look forward to your questions about um, what what my argument is. So, um, I I start the book with a, a human rights activist who was from Czechoslovakia uh, in in the old days of communism. Uh, and I start with a, a speech she gave in 1980 in in the West in in Ireland. Um, she had been in the middle of the 1970s um, part of Charter 77, which was a group that um, helped make the whole idea of human rights famous. So. She was one of the first people in history to think of herself as a human rights activist um, and was part of a, a group that defended human rights in her country uh, uh, under communist rule. And in fact, she was the spokesperson for this group. And when she was still in Czechoslovakia, among other things, the secret police uh, arrested her and pounded her head into the pavement on the street. Uh, and she reached the West because the, the state 
of, of Czechoslovakia uh, asked her to leave for a while and eventually said she couldn't come back. And uh, she gave this lecture in Ireland at a moment when people were very interested all of the sudden in human rights, which was suddenly a new idea around the world, especially the idea of invoking human rights um, against repressive states um, uh, by activists who were in, in, in connection with one another across borders. And yet, um, you know, this, this woman, Jdena Tominova, surprised her audience because she said that she loved socialism. She had been a young girl at the time of the coming of uh, socialism in her homeland of, of, of Czechoslovakia and had experienced a new kind of equality um, when it was possible for the rich to lose their privileges and the rest of Czech and Slovak citizens to um, feel like they were uh, uh, treated fairly relative to the rich. And she, she acknowledged that the idea of socialism had become an alibi for denying human rights. But she also said she didn't want the new idea of human rights uh, to become an excuse for the abandonment of equality and socialism. So in the meantime, uh, she, she didn't see her dream realized of human rights and socialism going together. What I'm showing you now is um, an n-gram, which is something that, that Google allows us to generate. You can too. It's for now only in a certain number of languages. I don't think um, yours is one of them, but pretty many languages, including Mandarin. And uh, what it does is calculate the percentage of books in any given year in which a term or phrase appears. And the main point of this chart is as follows. You can see that socialism, as a, as a word at least, and probably an idea, was much more prominent in language um, for most of the 20th century than the phrase human rights. Now, this is just in English, but I've checked all the other languages and you see the same thing. Um, now, hopefully someday we'll be able to check whether the same is true in your language, but my suspicion is that it is. And most people who were for or against socialism talked about it a lot more for most of the 20th century than they talked about human rights. But then you see that there's a reversal Right when that Czech dissident talked in 1977 or so, you see human rights begin to ascend. And interestingly, at that same moment, socialism declines. The lines cross around the end of the Cold War. So it seems as if the world exchanged socialism for human rights. That's not what Tominova wanted. And maybe it's not what a lot of people who were interested in human rights against repressive states wanted, but it happened. Uh, so we can say that the age of human rights is the age of the collapse of socialism. Now, why does this matter? Well, I want to tell a story about the history of human rights as an idea and as a legal um, regime and as a practice of movements across three stages in modern history to try to think about um, what we should conclude about human rights in their relationship to equality and socialism. So the three stages are as follows. First, let's just call it the 19th century, the age of capitalism and empire 
um, everywhere around the world. Then the second stage will be in the middle of the 20th century with the creation of welfare states um, and the end of empire um, very slowly. And then the third stage is our own stage uh, since let's say basically the middle of the 1970s, which we can call the age of human rights and a more neoliberal approach to political economy. And what I'll try to do is explain um, how the meaning of human rights changed in these three stages and what we should conclude today from this history. Before I start, I wanna make one critical distinction um, because it's a very important to my argument about the three stages. And it's a distinction between two different moral ideals you could hold about um, how the good things in life should be distributed, um, either to our fellow citizens or to our fellow human beings. Let's call the first ideal the ideal of um, distributional sufficiency. Sometimes I'll use the phrase sufficient provision. The idea here is that we should figure out how much people are entitled to as a bare minimum and then strive to meet that entitlement. Um, and the image I think you could have in mind is of building a floor so that no one is living on the bare ground, but at least has a floor when it comes to either money or to basic decencies on a list like housing, food, sanitation, water. Um, now there have been people both in the past and now who have claimed that if we think of hard, we should conclude that sufficient provision is what's morally required and that's all. The earliest person I found saying so is the person who instigated the American Revolution and was present during the French Revolution. His name was Thomas Paine, who said, it doesn't matter how rich the rich are if we end poverty. And today we have a very famous philosopher named Harry Frankfurt who says the same thing that, um, Inequality is not immoral, insufficiency is. So his thesis is that enough is enough. Um, now I'm gonna be arguing the opposite, that it does matter how rich the rich are, even if none are miserable. Um, and therefore that enough is not enough. And that's because I wanna put this second ideal of distribution in the picture. Um, not sufficient provision, but equal distribution. And the idea um, of, of equal distribution is Tominova's idea that it, it, we care about how much people have relative to one another, not just to some line of destitution. So the image here would be that of a ceiling. Sufficient provision builds a floor for every individual of entitlement. Equality demands a ceiling on inequality. Now we can debate how high or low the floor and the ceiling should be. My, my point is that these are different moral ideals. You could hold either, neither, or both. Um, and I wanna, you know, principally talk about the relation of human rights to these two different ideals. So starting out at the beginning, the age of 19th century capitalism and empire, we look and see um, that rights were centered around the property right by most people um, and around free, free enterprise and freedom of contract. Um, and in particular, there were movements in favor of freeing individuals to engage in um, contract and buy property. Uh, and in fact, the best rights 
that were defended by judges in many countries were these rights, not free speech, not right to not to be tortured, um, not economic and social rights, except for this one of free contract and um, and and sacrosanct property. And, you know, the results of that first human rights order what was pretty terrible um uh, there were a lot of poor people um and even though there was unprecedented growth in human history and and extraordinary inequality so from the perspective of the first two moral ideals the first stage in my story is one in which rights are connected to neither one actually human rights promote um, a, a political economy or are connected to a political economy in which there are are lots of poor people and increasing inequality now that changed in the middle of the 20th century in different places to different extents um, especially starting with the Mexican constitution of 1917 in Latin America, and then across the Atlantic um, in between the first world war and the second world war when welfare states were built. And the main idea I want to you know, leave you with about this second stage is that um, welfare states were about taking both moral ideals seriously. They cared about the poor, and that's why they did things like provide unprecedented state intervention in the economy um, and new forms of state provision like universal health care in some countries, um, unemployment benefits, uh, minimum wages, and so forth and so on. Um, and these same states constrained inequality. So in, in modern history, the age in which there was least economic inequality was the middle of the 20th century in these welfare states. Now we should note a few features of these states. They were, they were national projects. The question was not the relation of, um, of, of humans around the world, or even since this was the age of European empire, of colonial subjects to metropolitan citizens. Um, rather, it was, um, you know, the relation of, of people within nation states. So consider, just as an example, that in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, the end of World War II brought about an, a new kind of welfare state, but that didn't mean that the vast British Empire um, what became more equal. Only the British islands did. Um, and the same was true um, for sufficient provision. Now, what happened to the idea of rights in this age? You probably know that in the 19th century, um, the founder of, of, of Marxism, Karl Marx, had argued that rights were, were by definition a capitalist project um, and that socialists should abandon human rights for that reason. Well, in the middle of the 20th century, that view came to seem premature. Um, on the one hand, many reformers didn't like the idea of rights because of the role they had played in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. And you can see a quotation on the slide from a liberal um, Englishman who said, you know, uh, we should abandon rights because um, they don't help in either achieving sufficient provision or equal distribution. But from the Mexican constitution on, there were many attempts to see if rights could play a new, new role. And there, the, a, a new kind of right, which we often call social rights, was invented. 
um, and these were um, rights in the Mexican constitution and later in most constitution worldwide to the basic decencies. The point I wanna make is that even when rights uh, turned out to be far more flexible and for reformers salvageable than Marx thought, um, they weren't in this period just connected to sufficient provision. They were also about equal distribution. And my main witness is going to be this great English soci sociologist named T.H. Marshall, whom you see on the screen. And he actually um, is the one from whom I'm borrowing my earlier metaphor of the floor and the ceiling. What Marshall says is that welfare states are about providing social rights, um, but the, it would be wrong to think of that project as just about a floor because the welfare state is also about a ceiling constraining inequality. Now, he was naive, I think, at, at the time he wrote. He thought that if you decided in a state to build a floor of protection uh, for citizens, the rich would have to pay and they would become poorer. You can probably already think about why this was naive, but at the time he was living, when you had fewer poor people because of the welfare state, but also constrained inequality, you can understand why he thought the way he did. Now, just briefly, I, I want to say in passing that you probably know about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was um, propounded by the United Nations right when Marshall was thinking about social rights. And like the Mexican Constitution, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides a lot of economic and social rights. What I want to say is that in history, we can see this document as a charter for this second stage, the national welfare stage. And what it does very specifically is try to make human rights safe for a new kind of state that will pursue sufficient provision and equal distribution. Okay, you know, just briefly, since I know I'm speaking to a, a, an audience in Thailand, um, you know, I, I mentioned that the welfare states were often imperial states, um, but decolonization happened around the world, including in Asia, and most post-colonial states wanted to create their own welfare states. That was the point of um, decolonization. And if we look, most post-colonial thinkers and leaders insisted on the value, not so much of sufficient provision, but of distributional equality. That's what they say they're setting out to provide. Um, and actually, these same thinkers and statesmen try to raise the value of equality from the level of nation states to the world stage. No one in the second stage had really done so, um, in part because they were often at, at he the heads of empires, but the leaders of new post-colonial states had a, a big vision of global equality, equality amongst states rather than within them alone. And, and yet their project, which came to kind of most fame in the middle of the 1970s with something called the New International Economic Order Proposals failed. So then we get the third stage, which is our time. And the basic question is, how do we think about the fact that Tominova was wrong and the age of human rights ended up being the age of the victory of the rich? Um, so that's what I want to talk about. In, in general, um, we talk about the history of political economy since the 1970s as the neoliberal era. Um, states were disempowered. Um, there was privatization, deregulation, and states um, began to um, try to constrain their generosity uh, in social provision. 
And the question is, you know, it's a big debate and I'm just one person in it. How should we think about the relation of human rights to this current political economy of neoliberalism? Well, my, my basic um, stance is that we should be very careful for a few reasons. Um, first, human rights as an idea never reverted to the, the version of human rights in the first stage I covered. Human rights are still a reformist cause for many. Um, they're not narrowly about the defense of free enterprise, contract, and property. Um, neoliberals tried to claim that human rights were their ideas, but they have not succeeded. And human rights remain a cause that has proved very flexible, um, including for reformers. Um, human rights have also, in the neoliberal era, our own age been connected to status equality. I've been talking for most of this lecture about economic or distributional equality, um, how much money and, and things and services you get, um, including income and wealth. But um, we've seen huge gains around the world in what you could call status equality, which is the idea that no one should be treated differently because of their gender, race, disability, indigeneity, sexual orientation. Finally, after World War, uh, sorry, the end of the Cold War, um, in the spirit of the Mexican constitution, many human rights activists and groups and um, many human rights legal regimes have been built around sufficient provision. That's to say, um, in courts or otherwise, human rights are not neoliberal. They're, they're increasingly associated with pursuing um, that floor of protection, a basic minimum of uh, you know, food or housing or health care or sanitation or water. But the basic claim I want to make is that what's distinctive about human rights in the neoliberal age is that unlike socialism, they don't call for or result in distributional equality, equality of um, money or income or wealth or the good things in life. Um, and so what I'm claiming is that what, what is interesting about human rights is that they have become, unlike in the first two stages, a project of just building a floor of protection um, and leaving out whether there should be a ceiling on inequality. And in fact, uh, uh, they have survived, unlike socialism, because human rights have turned out in our era to be compatible with building a floor even while in many places inequality has increased when the ceiling on distributional unfairness has been obliterated. Now to kind of substantiate this argument, there's not time in three minutes. I just acknowledge we'd have to look across time since the first neoliberal state was Chile in 1973, and then you get some um, Anglo-American events in 1979-80. Um, in Eastern Europe, it takes till the end of the 80s for this to happen. And we'd have to look across Africa and Asia. Uh, we'd also have to look above each state to look at international institutions, most notably the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. I try to do some of this in my book, not enough, but there's not time. So I'll just summarize. The basic idea I'm offering is that the neoliberal age of human rights is one of Marshall's nightmare. Remember I said Marshall said sufficient provision and equal distribution go together. Um, and my claim is that he was mistaken because our age shows that they're different. 
and human rights have become about building a floor even while uh, the ceiling on inequality is destroyed in many places. Um, and maybe that's why the two, um, uh, why socialism died even as human rights survived because socialism is not compatible with the neoliberal project, but um, human rights are at least when they're conceived of as a project of building a floor. Um, you can think of it in terms of, you know, children um, who play alongside each other without interacting. Um, you can imagine the human rights movement building a floor even while the neoliberal movement is obliterating the ceiling. And it turns out that these two things are, are compatible. They can happen at the same time. If you want, um, it's China that provides the, the Marshall's nightmare in its most extraordinary form. As you probably know, um, since it marketized in 1980, China has um, practically eliminated so-called extreme poverty in its country. Um, and we're talking about 700 million people who were brought above the threshold of sufficient provision as defined by the World Bank's extreme poverty measure. At the same time, in the same period, China became more unequal more quickly than any place in world history. And actually, this is just a version of what's occurred in many countries. Less poverty, more inequality. And my suggestion is that human rights in our third stage fit with that uh, outcome. So what are my conclusions? Um, I'm a human rights advocate. I think human rights are important, um, but they don't provide everything. So we should stand up for them as one set of, of good things. And of course, in a, a place like Thailand, this is especially important to say since um, basic liberties and sufficient provision do really matter. But my suggestion is that we should return to Tominova's dream and retrieve, um, if not socialism, then her ideal of equality alongside human rights. Sort of for two separate reasons. One, although I haven't provided any real argument, um, I think there are ethical reasons to say that not just sufficient provision, but also equal distribution are, 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 is morally important. But we're also seeing a wave of populism around the world and, it, and, and a rise in dictatorships and demagoguery. And I think it's partly the case that um, this is occurring because of the extraordinary rises in inequality, even as there's less poverty. And if that's true, if dictators and demagogues assault human rights and rise to power because of increasing inequality, then it turns out that, um, that human rights are hostage, at least in part, to um, the, the larger situation of inequality. Um, and so even if you don't think equality is ethically important, you might think you have to provide more of it in order for human rights to have the conditions to be honored. So I'll stop there. Um, I've argued, you know, just briefly that um, human rights went through three stages. What's unique about our own is that they're compatible with increasing inequality and we need to bring back more equality in a future stage um, in order not just for human rights to survive, but for a broader ethical um, you know, progress to occur. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Des. 
for me that's yeah. very interesting as you know we never think about human rights as a like as the like neo neoliberalism uh, contribute to its like inequality yeah yeah, yeah. i think and that's um i don't think this aspect has been mentioned too much in thailand you know when sometimes when we talk about human rights it's about our like yeah. the flaw you know like so, okay. about the, our rights to live our rights in our property our yeah. right to speak but not economic inequality and yeah the history of human rights has shown has shown is like development you know yeah. from capitalism to like in the mid um 20th century and to the age of neoliberalism so native it has some question for you yeah thank you very much professor um i think uh, your point of view is very interesting uh human rights in thailand we have seen is like a hagiography right only talk about a good side you understand but, uh, that because uh yeah. th you know the according to the information i've seen the human rights record of the government is appalling it's ba very bad but on the other hand thailand i believe fits my picture um in as much as in recent decades there's been a lot of um of poverty remediation um while inequality persists or even grows so i mean i I, I just am looking at now. I'll just show the uh, show my uh, screen one one more time, but uh, just to for one second to show you this uh, this chart, uh, which it 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 suggests right. how extraordinary inequality is even regionally within Southeast Asia. So uh, it's again, it's uh, it's it's that doesn't mean we should abandon criticizing terrible regimes for human rights violations, but that it's not the only thing that matters. Yeah, um, I want to I want you to uh, maybe elaborate a little bit more about um, uh, the how neoliberalism in 1970s had um you know been cooperated with human rights with i think human rights had been pursued by many anti-colonial yes. movement around yes. here. so how Good. it became it's like a wonderful a question so um you know anti-colonial movements were in 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 the first instance about um um rec reclaiming sovereignty um, ejecting foreign rulers, um, and they they talked. The leaders of those movements, in general, talked a lot less about human rights. Um, they they mainly were concerned with one right, what we now call the right to collective self determination. Um, but that wasn't exactly an individual right like the rest of human rights. It was a collective right, and it was focused outwards towards empires that should go away. And that was of major significance for human emancipation. But what it didn't talk much about is the relation between citizens and especially the economic situation within new post-colonial states. The reason for this is, is I think because people believed that development in poor states required ignoring the poor and increasing inequality because of a belief that um, developmental states would have to have a period like the 19th century in, in the global north of increasing inequality before you could you could have a welfare state so you know the most famous theory of this time was called modernization theory and in many places including 
uh, in Southeast Asia, it actually led some to call for authoritarianism because the argument was that only authoritarian governments could achieve modernization. Now, in the 1970s, um, many people concluded that um, that there were there was too much despotism and too much violence, um, and that it wasn't credible to wait um, for things to get better. Um, and so, a number of things happened. First, the human rights movement emerged and began cr criticizing despotisms um, and authoritarian rule. In development, you see the emergence of new theories of basic needs, um, which is the idea that we can't wait on the poor. We have to actually help them right away. And that's the origin of all the, you know, theories and practices we have of of anti-poverty. What I think is significant is that the first human rights activists were focused um, on the state and its actions and left out political economy altogether. Um, a good example would be Amnesty International, which helps make the Universal Declaration of Human Rights famous but leaves out the second half of it. So the first causes of Amnesty International are unjust imprisonment, and then they add torture, and then they add the death penalty. Not until the late 1990s do human rights activists in Amnesty International begin to call for distributional fairness and they call for anti-poverty, which is just about sufficient provision. Now, unlike some Marxist um, thinkers today, I don't um, believe that human rights are neoliberal. I've tried to show you today that they're compatible with a neoliberal order. Um, but um, it is very significant that human rights lost touch with distribution. Um, and when they became connected to distribution after the Cold War, it was just a sufficient provision. And human rights, unlike in the welfare state era, have not yet um, become connected to an egalitarian project distributionally. So my claim is not that human rights are neoliberal. It's that they... Um, choices were made that left human rights movements, even today, compatible with greater and greater inequality. Now, you two are muted for me if No, I still, I didn't, I don't hear you. Is that? I have my, I have not changed anything. So it, it isn't working the way it was before. Can you hear us? Yes, now, perfect. Yes, now sorry. I can hear you. Okay, sorry about yeah. that. Oh no, Some sorry about the happened. technical difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so just as we have less time, but just want to say that ironically, mm -hmm. this guy was a committee of MSC in the national yeah. you know, <laughs> in Thailand. <laughs> yeah, and what's your opinion like? At it, is it like as um, Samuel Mon? said about the MSC, do you agree with that? Yeah, but um, as you said, some, some that uh, amnesty now, um, they, I think they have been challenges uh, as many people have been more critical. Yeah. And in, yes. I think in Southeast Asia. Oh, sorry, it went mute again.
Oh, shit. Just four minutes. No, no, no problem. No, no problem. I can hear you now, by the way. All right, so a few minutes. <laughs> Some technical issue. I see. Again. Yeah, it's working now. The okay, great. Issue. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, because we have lesser time. So yeah. I just want to ask. Uh, I just want to ask mm -hmm. your opinion about our situation in Thailand. You know, um, recently, as we talked before about our movement, we have a political struggle towards um, democracy. You know, since many are uh, like. Um, Many demands for welfare state in Thailand, um, yes. and yes, there is a new movement called RT movement, which I'm gonna show it to you. Okay. And it starts a controversy in the yeah, among us, the, yeah. the like the activists and academics. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So a few minutes just to show you a logo of it. Okay. All right, can you see? Yes, yes, you showed me before. Yeah, um, it used like hammer and sickle as its logo. And so yes. many, uh, many suggest that it might, you know, it the, the logo, the hammer and sickle is attached with some trauma of Eastern European and we should not use that or even something is okay. And many are like, uh, afraid of communism in Thailand, as you know, in Cold War period, we have yeah. like we have some like scary history about it. And yeah, just want to ask you, like, what's your opinion on this? Why why we are seeing this communism ideology again in in yes yes nowadays? IT and what do you think about the logo? You know, good. <laughs> Many are reading about it. <laughs> well, you know, as I told you to before we began, I've only been to Thailand once for two days, and I I regret that I haven't uh, spent more time there and and seen more of the country and learned an, enough to comment intelligently. Um, so I'll just speak in generalities. Um, yeah. You know, as we know, in much of the post-colonial world and in Southeast Asia and in, 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 you know, extraordinary ways, Marxism and communism became the default socialism. Um, and, uh, you know, even when they relied on, you know, many peasant activists who had no idea what, you know, who Karl Marx was, um, the, the Marxism became very prominent. But I think um, I've tried to argue today that m at least Marx's own approach and that of many Marxists is not correct. Um, and my own view is that Marx was hostile to or insensitive to the importance of political democracy. Um, and you know, we can get into very long debates about why Marxist states became so despotic. But I, I think that um, it is worth a movement that, like the Czech dissident I began with, focuses on human rights, including democratic rights and, democ and, and socialism alongside um, yeah, so a democratic form of socialism. Now, I'll just mention that um, the human rights movement historically has not been all that much connected to the, the democratic ideal, um, especially in the early decades of the 1970s and 80s, because there was an assumption that despotic regimes would last indefinitely long. And the best we could do is get them to stop torturing 
or get them to stop imprisoning. And the truth is that it hasn't been human rights movements that have provided democratic transitions. Um, they've helped once um, those have occurred, like in, say, in South Africa or many other places. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, if it's possible, um, we should uh, pursue, you know, a, a more clearly democratic form of socialism than the hammer and sickle implies in world history. Now, I don't know about local local movements that you're referring to, and maybe they're democratic, maybe they're not. Um, just one more thing, you know, what I haven't at all addressed is whether we should think human rights movements should become more concerned with equality, or rather, whether they should be part of, a, of an ecosystem or ecology or setting in which there are movements for human rights, and there are movements for equality, and they're allies, or they get along with each other. My concern is that human rights movements have gotten along with neoliberalism. And I would like to see a world in which there are more egalitarian movements and human rights movements um, remain important to criticize uh, uh, what egalitarians do if they enter power. I mean, that hasn't happened anywhere almost, but it, we should want it to happen. And then we should want human rights to be, to be um, available to criticize any regime, whether it's democratic or not, whether it's more egalitarian or less egalitarian. Um, and, and so that's, that's what I have to say. All right, thank you very much. I think it's question and time Q&A session for our audience. And I think there has been already one question which I think related with your with yeah. your answer. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna wait to you. So Mr. Tirapat Arunat, he in promoting the idea of socialism or uh, specifically the distributive e equality, in your opinion, do we have to wage a hegemonic war on the idea of human rights? Since we have seen the right wing adaptation to the human rights narrative. Good. Fantastic and, question. Um I would say um Yes, that if 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 he means um, th is that a he? Um, if he yeah, means yeah. Um, that that we have to um, not attack human rights, but attack the hegemony of human rights um, as you know what 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 we believe in. Um, then I think we have to. I've argued that the trouble with human rights is that especially in recent decades, they've been very selective. They pursue part of the good, just sufficient provision, but they leave a lot out, including um, most notably equal distribution. And so I, 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 I would say we have to, um, you know, we have to wage war on, on, on the hegemony of human rights in order to make clear how selective they are. But that's not the same as waging war on human rights. Um, I think one symptom of the hegemony of human rights as the questioner identifies is that once they become so important, everyone will claim their own version of human rights. And we've seen that today, the right has moved from rejecting human rights to saying it has the proper version of human rights. And actually that's true amongst populists as well. Um, not, you know, China, the Chinese regime offered an early version of this, but in many democracies, you find right-wing versions of the human rights project. And my suggestion is um, that's in part the price of success. Um, and I'm trying to tarnish that success, not because I hate human rights, but because I think the hegemony of human rights has uh, masked a lot of problems we need to face. Oh, fantastic answer. Yeah. And I think we can use 
like think about your answer and to like construct our movement further in Thailand. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, like the like hegemony of human rights, you know, uh, uh, is influential in Thailand, and yeah, it might undermine the the importance of economic equality. Um. So. So for our audience in Facebook, if you guys have some question, we are so welcome. You know, to have your question today. Um. All right. Oh, maybe I will ask a little bit. Um, okay. as you you said in the book that um, um, human rights movement cannot reinvent itself with new ideas and tools, so it should stick to what it does best, inform our concepts, and um, to stigmatize evil without purporting to stand for the whole, something like that. So yes. uh, you mean that uh, human rights should be uh, another movement. And then uh, we have um, equality movement, yes. right? Uh, yes. It should That's, be mix, mixing a bit. You know, so I think this is a great debate because I don't necessarily know the right answer. Um, and in fact, you know, the response to my book has been very often that human rights either already are egalitarian, which I think is is false. Um, uh, or if it's true, it's embarrassing because inequality is increasing in many places. Or um, other people more persuasively have said human rights movements could become egalitarian. And, and maybe that's true. I doubt it. Um, uh, I, I'm a, my position is that human rights movements are not very good at their core tasks of stigmatizing bad regimes uh, for, you know, minimal, minimal kinds of, um, you know, violations. And so I think that we should let human rights movements um, remain what they have been um, and allow other movements to kind of coexist with them. And I think the only amendment I would offer is that you know, I've tried to say that human rights um, ideologues and 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 movement participants should be ashamed of prospering and becoming hegemonic in a neoliberal age. They should want to have other movements alongside of them that resist neoliberalism. Um, but that doesn't mean that human rights movements themselves become socialist movements um in part because i'd like to see socialist movements actually take state power but then we need watchdogs for them um and human rights could movements could remain separate but as you say this is a conceptual answer and in real politics we will see a lot of examples of blending of overlap of hybrid movements that pursue both things or that kind of move from one to the other. And, and that should be very exciting um, in the future if, if it happens. Okay, thank you. And yeah, just wonder, are, are there any movements that, you know, like reattach the human rights into like the egalitarian campaigns that you have seen or like- Yes. That, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, you know, the only I, 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 the only example that I, I feel confident about citing is one in my country, which is, you know, that young people are have rediscovered socialism. Um, and in recent years, they have um, backed various politicians uh, who are, you know, criticizing the neoliberal parties, including the, the Democratic Party, which is the left party in the United States. And um, their standard bearer has been Bernie Sanders. Um, and interestingly, Bernie Sanders connects a rhetoric of sufficient provision, notably when he calls for healthcare as a human right, with a critique of, of economic oligarchy so he's very much a proponent of equality 
as well. So he's kind of my my you know model, um, and 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 the question is whether that's uh, you know what other versions there are worldwide. Now, ultimately, in the long run, we can't rest content with different national movements because the fundamental reality of our world is the the income and wealth gap between nations. Um, and so we would want a vision of sufficient provision that is about um, fair distribution globally. And in the long run, we would want more global equality so that, um, mm. you know, we didn't have to live in a world like ours where the most important fact about every individual and what their life is like is what state they're born in. Um, and in particular, whether they're born in the global north or south. That's, uh, that's a global version of this concern and we're nowhere near confronting it, I think. Yeah. So we, I think we need transnational movement on eco, egalitarian yeah. society. Yes. So that's a state, you know, but so, yes. all right. So, you, you know, know, that was the original post-colonial dream, as I mentioned very briefly in the lecture in the mid 1970s, that was the, the ultimate prize of post-colonial states was an egalitarian world. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> so Nate, we just want to yeah. ask about uh, your, as you already wrote last, uh, Utopia yeah. and Not yeah. Enough. So, what's next book that uh, uh, yes. you intend? Uh, I finished a new book that's coming out in the fall about, um, about the history of warfare and the attempt to regulate it in, in law and you know, my basic argument is that we need more peace movements and um, the ideal of humane war, making war less brutal uh, and violent, it is, is, has limitations. Um, so it's actually very similar to what we've just been talked about, talking about that it's important to strive for, um, uh, more humane war, but not if we lose peace as an ideal. Um, and I'm, I'm making that argument because my country has fought more and more wars and said that, that, that at least they're more humane in the way they're fought. And this is unacceptable. So that is my next project and it's coming out soon. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, the end of our conversation and, and okay. we are looking forward to your new book yeah okay thank All you right. I hope it will spark a lot of debate on yeah our, i hope so uh, I yeah hope we hope so okay yeah. so thank you very much um samuel Mon, and we hope that we can visit you someday and yeah you can visit up someday no i want to visit you after the pandemic it would be lovely to, oh, yeah, to, right. to meet yeah. him in thailand all right thank okay you good to much. see you okay bye, bye, -bye. ก็จบลงไปแล้วนะครับวันนี้สําหรับเซสชันนะครับอาจจะมีผิดพลาดเล็กน้อยผิดพลาดเล็กน้อยนะครับเนื่องจากสายไฟไม่ค่อยดีนะครับแต่ก็จบลงไปได้ได้ดีแล้วก็หวังว่าเราจะได้เหมือนแง่มุมใหม่เกี่ยวกับฮิวแมนไรซ์ที่เกิดขึ้นเนาะซึ่งประวัติศาสตร์ของสิทธิมนุษยชนเองก็ได้แสดงให้เห็นอะไรบางอย่างว่ามันเกิดขึ้นแล้วมันมีพลังอํานาจเป็นคําพูดที่มันช่างทรงพลังในทุกวันนี้ยังไงนะครับก็ฝากติดตามตอนต่อไปของ Beyond Boundaries นะครับผ่านเพจสมูสอนนิสิตรัฐศาสตร์จุฬานะครับวันนี้ก็ขอลาไปก่อนครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ